Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so first of all, thanks a lot for you know, giving me the opportunity to present the work that we've done with uh, Markus Schmidt, uh, mostly while we were still postdocs at Berkeley before uh, moving to different institutions in Europe. So um, the main objective of well, our work and also of this talk will be how can we detect and characterize uh, local complexity of quantum states. And we've uh, done an attempt for this using uh, machine learning with uh, neural networks. And um, what I mean by this uh, kind of local, sorry, uh, local complexity is really whatever can be detected with some local measurements. And uh, kind of to characterize it, we'll simply ask for example, how many uh, parameters we need to um, reproduce all uh, local obser observables that we would measure. And um, besides just the, the so what this will be useful for will be, for example, uh, to detect different stages of uh, non-equilibrium dynamics, to detect whether the dynamics is thermalizing or non-therm or the Hamiltonian, uh, that's governing, governing dynamics is leading to thermalization or not. And there will also be some interesting side products. For example, we'll be able to uh, learn Hamiltonians from the uh, observations. And since this is really kind of um, based on, on local measurements, we believe it could be a good way to analyze and characterize quantum simulators during the real uh, time evolution and could even um, give us a way to maybe detect what kind of uh, noise might be uh, inherently present in our simulator. So to be concrete, uh, we'll look at several aspects of um, this kind of quite general uh, example. So suppose we would initialize our state in some translational invariant product state, which is clearly very simple and characterized with um, two parameters, which are the two angles giving the direction of the spins. Now, if we run uh, some um, time evolution with some interacting Hamiltonian or with some entangling gates, of course, the complexity of this state will uh, grow, essentially up to the point when the system gets so scrambled that if we look at it locally, will not be able to detect the, the full complexity. And instead, uh, we'll see that this local complexity is actually going down because the only things that kind of matter at these later times are the conservation loss of our system. And we've kind of learned that we can actually use emergent hydrodynamic descriptions based on this uh, coming from the conservation loss. And at the very end, when the system is relaxing towards the steady state, it's actually this typically described with some statistical description, uh, such as Gibbs or generalized Gibbs um, ensemble, since if we're interested, as I said, in, in some local region, the rest of the system can uh, act as a, as a buff. And we've also now uh, learn from other studies that if the time evolution is governed by the chaotic Hamiltonian, um, the system will be kind of described by a, a Gibbs ensemble characterized just with a single parameter temperature. But if it's uh, the evolution would have additional conservation loss, then also the ensemble would have additional Lagrange multipliers uh, corresponding to additional conservation loss. And kind of our goal was to, to use uh, neural networks to, in some sense, um, and, and let's say give them as an input uh, local measurements and then ask uh, and do machine learning to extract the main physics or kind of this cartoon that I'm presenting uh, here. So, so the question is, yeah, essentially how to compress this perhaps nasty quantum evolution into something simple and yeah, at least look, when we look at it locally. And to do so, we used autoencoders, which are yeah, the neural network architecture uh, shown here, which are outside of physics really used for, uh, for compression. Because what's the 
uh, purpose or what the auto encoder does, it takes some initial data and uh, it tries to reproduce it by going through a bottleneck. So, so kind of the objective is that it try. so here the encoder tries to do this dimensional reduction. So it asks whether our data set actually has some smaller intrinsic dimension. And the, um, this reconstruction will be successful as long as our bottleneck is larger or equal than this intrinsic dimension. Now, in our case, the, this data set will be given by um, all expectation values. So we'll consider uh, spin systems and we'll look at all expectation values uh, uh, up to some given support. So that would be some um, strings of, of Pauli operators up to support, let's say, three or four. And, um, but of course, to do the training and learning, we will need several. So, so one data set is all operators up to support four, but we'll need several of such data sets to perform the learning. And of course, these data sets then must have a similar complexity. And uh, the network, so the parameters of the networks, uh, network are um, set by, um, yeah, now showing the network, um, several of, of such data sets and asking it to reproduce the, the input as good as possible uh, to, so that it matches the output um, by going through this bottleneck. And then uh, we test uh, our network by showing it some unseen sets of expectation values and asking how well can it reproduce them at the output and then essentially test. So, so compare the reproduced expectation value with respect to the original ones for a given uh, this latent space or the bottleneck uh, size. And we'll benchmark uh, our approach by looking here at the simplest situation. So in this physical setup in the steady state, but essentially first asking, let's say if I show it thermal expectation values, um, maybe at different temperatures, but same Hamiltonian. So for different uh, observables, will it realize that this data uh, is parameterized only with one parameter temperature? And then if I, when I add more parameters, will it also kind of figure out that there are additional parameters in uh, the ensemble that I'm um, using? So that's exactly what we do. So we feed in here in the network expectation values with respect to either a Gibbs ensemble with a single parameter temperature or a generalized Gibbs ensemble with some, for now, a fixed number of uh, Lagrange multipliers. And to do this, we'll use uh, transverse, uh, transverse field teasing model, which is integrable and has uh, also additional conservation. Also, we'll use, let's say, first and see local, most local conservation loss. And then we look at, so how well does the network reproduce this initial um, uh, expectation values. We look at the here at the difference, and of course, as we would like, uh, what happens is that this um, error drops when the bottleneck is at at least as big as the number of conservation loss in in our uh, ensemble. So when I have a thermal ensemble, it drops uh, already with, with the latent space uh, dimension one. When I have two at two, three at three. So, kind of no surprise, it just confirms that indeed uh, this um, network is able to, to detect the inherent dimension of our data. And it sees that the Lagrange multipliers are what is characterizing the data, no matter which uh, set of, uh, kind of observables we show to it. But we can do, it's interesting to do kind of one step uh, further towards uh, interpretable learning and try to understand or ask how does the network see our data? So our set of uh, operators, expectation values of those here in the latent space. Um, and let's say we, we allow for latent space with dimension two. 
And then each of these data sets, which let's say 100 operators, will be mapped to one point here in the latent space. And uh, it's very nice to observe that um, even when we allow for a larger bottleneck, I mean, we know we actually need just a single parameter or so, and, and then that's a single neuron here. But even if we allow for more of them, we see that the, the representation of our, our data is actually one dimensional. So it lies on a one dimensional manifold that is, um, as we can see here, ordered with respect to the energy or equivalently um, temperature. So kind of our network really figured out that, that energy density or, or temperature is what is characteristic of our data. And that's another way to see it that because it kind of orders it in, in the latent space with respect to this parameter. And uh, this can be actually um, now utilized because suppose you were just given expectation values and you could test that they are thermal because they are parameterized with one, uh, you, you would see that, okay, you, there's only one parameter which is characterizing, so they kind of must be thermal. Um, and then one could actually now use this property to reconstruct the Hamiltonian because not only energy density is varying monotonously along this manifold, also, terms from the Hamiltonian will do the same. So what we can do now is that we can actually look at for look for operators with um, largest gradient, average gradient along, along this manifold here. And in this way, we single out the candidate terms for the Hamiltonian. Um, and then, um, to set the relative weights with respect to them, we need to also do another step of Newton's method where we compare um, the measured expectation values with respect to this thermal one with this kind of trial Hamiltonians. So we see that not only we could detect from the data that this, it, it is thermal, it also allows us to reconstruct the Hamiltonian if we kind of didn't know from which Hamiltonian exactly um, this data is coming from. Now, when we, that was kind of the simplest case when we were feeding in thermal expectation values. Now, if we just add additional um, Lagrange multipliers, so kind of a, a expectation values with respect to a generalized Gibbs ensemble, we will see that here in the, in the latent space, this will now look more 2D-ish, with one direction spanned by the uh, Hamiltonian and the perpendicular direction spanned by this additional uh, conservation law. Dala, we have four minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is really, okay, I'll speed up. Um, so yeah, so, so that was kind of benchmarking. So we could have done really, um, a quench where we would have waited for the system to relax to this uh, to this ensembles, and it would be, for example, interesting to ask, um, okay, if I have an integrable evolution, which Lagrange multipliers are really important in it? But I'll we kind of added another twist to the story and actually look at the time evolution. Uh, in the presence of a weak uh, coupling to baths, so a weak, weak nose. So, so suppose like we did a quench with a Hamiltonian that is chaotic or integrable, but we also added some weak coupling to baths. So from our previous work, we know that, um, that the system will, even in the presence of weak coupling to baths, the system will still relax to a steady state that will be thermal for chaotic uh, domin uh, Hamiltonian evolution and will be a GG if this Hamiltonian is integrated. Now, this is just the kind of the dominant description because of this coupling to baths, there are also some uh, weak corrections to it. And now we can kind of um, see how, how, how our network kind of, um, yeah, how, in what way it will see the corrections and also, um, yeah, to see how we can characterize the steady states that we obtain in such a way. And we do this by doing that 
time evolution with the same Hamiltonian, but different randomly rotated single and two sides lingot operators. And what we can see that for chaotic time evolution, when we again look at, so what's this test error? So how many um, neurons we, re we need in the bottleneck? We see that we get a decent description with a single neuron and then kind of um, a further improvement uh, with an additional one. So one neuron responsible for kind of capturing this thermal state and then an additional one for capturing some uh, yeah, features of the bath or these corrections to the Gibbs ensemble. When the evolution is with respect to integrable Hamiltonian, we clearly need uh, more uh, parameters. But again, if we are looking at operators up to support four, we also do not need macroscopically many uh, conservation laws as, as one would kind of really expect in, in pure, I mean, in exactly, but we see that this is also gives us a way to kind of detect how many conservation loss we need max for, for a pretty good description of uh, local operators. And you see that it's quite small. So we can survive with an truncated uh, GG. Now, when we once again look here, how, how this data looks like in the latent space, we see that for the chaotic Hamiltonian, the, the this um, representation, the latent space representation will be roughly one dimensional as, uh, with the dominant uh, direction spanned by the Hamiltonian. While for the integrable um, case, it will be um, yeah, more dimensional and the, the, the dominant directions are spanned by the first two um, parity even conservation laws. So if there are some experts in the audience, so we actually, so in this case, we actually allow for a four dimensional latent space and then we map it to 2D using uh, TSNI. But it's interesting to ask, so what is causing kind of this spread in the perpendicular direction already for the chaotic Hamiltonian? And to understand this better, we used paths that were kind of had some structure. So for example, we used nuclear operators with different rates, but all of them promoting antiferromagnetic correlations, uh, for example, by flipping up if your neighbor was down or, or so. And we clearly saw that this perpendicular direction is in this case spanned by the correlations that the um, noise or the baths are promoting. So in some way, we not only are kind of able to reconstruct the Hamiltonian, we can also if the time evolution is with respect to some noisy dynamics, we can detect the type of the noise that is present in the system. And now uh, in the final few slides, let me kind of um, go back to this initial cartoon and try to capture this bottleneck in, the, in a generic time of evolution. Um, for the reasons I can kind of comment in the questions, um, we actually do uh, not we do a, a time evolution with respect to random unitaries. So we initialize the system in a simple product state, and then we run the time evolution with translationally invariant uh, random unitaries with one conservation, so with magnetization conservation, and then different at each time step. And then we, so what we feed in the network is that each time all local operators have to support three. And then again, we look at, so how well can the network reproduce uh, the, the observations by going through this bottleneck as a function of time and the dimension of the uh, latent space of the bottleneck. And we clearly see that initially we need only two parameters, then we can detect the growth of complexity and at later times the uh, onset of hydrodynamic description all the way down to to the steady state, which is characterized only with one uh, Lagrange multiplier um, for, for the organization conservation. So, so far we are only able to essentially detect um, these different uh, regimes uh, in such a generic um, time evolution, but it, 
the hope or the ambition would be that one could also kind of reconstruct the underlying, um, let's say, hydrodynamic uh, descriptions governing the, um, yeah, the evolution, the effective description. So this brings me to the conclusion. Uh, so uh, yeah, what I've tried to argue is that we propose the machine learning um, kind of agnostic approach to detect and characterize complexity and, and of quantum states and search for effective, uh, simple physical descriptions that apply locally. Um, and this was applied to closed open and open systems with kind of several um, nice side effects of, for example, reconstructing the Hamiltonian from measurements and uh, also, let's say, reconstructing the type of noise that might be uh, present uh, in the system, but unknown to us as an observer. And as I said, since we only need uh, local measurements, we hope that yeah, this should be in an interesting uh, tool um, to apply to experimental uh, data. So yeah, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much, Zala. Something that Let I like. Just turn on the light because it's gone really yes, dark. Yes, you went completely black, which I found extremely pleasant aesthetically. Also, uh, it's nice that you dedicated the time to a single topic, which I think makes a lot of room for discussion and questions. So people online or people at KDP, raise your hand or go to the microphone in Connell. If there are... Maybe, uh, maybe I ask a question. Uh, hi, Zala, thanks for the nice slide. Uh, one question is, uh, let's say if you're not uh, um, interested in the dynamics at uh, short times, can you still say something about the uh, long uh, time, uh, stationary state of long times? My question is, if for some reason you can't uh, uh, efficiently describe the intermediate time dynamics, this method will still be useful just with the late time description? Yeah, because you can simply just feed in the measurements with respect to your uh, steady state density matrix, and that, that's essentially what we did here. Um, I mean, now this is either, yeah, you, you, you just feed in the, the measurements at these late times, and then you will be able to for now detect how many, per how complex is this uh, steady state, how many parameters are characterizing it, and if you have some further knowledge that you, yeah, uh, so that's the case if you have access to the final state, right? But let's say that you want to run some uh, simulations, right? So you don't ha have access to the data, but rather you just want to, you know, uh, make this uh, simulation more efficient and access is long time dynamics. It yeah, does yeah. do anything? So far, uh, not. So yeah, that would be even, so let's say our next goal is to try to find some sort of hydrodynamic description in the latent space, but then um, the even more ambitious thing is how you could kind of compress the rest into an into an inefficient local description where the baths are feeding in, but we are not there yet. Thanks. One sh very short question. So when you learn about the Hamiltonian, do you, uh, uh, do you just uh, try the local terms for the Hamiltonian or uh, you have more flexibility on that? Yeah, you can, um, I mean, here we, we did this with, uh, with transverse field teasing with only like ultra, I mean, with, with of course two and single site. And then, um, I mean, the, when you have a more complicated Hamiltonian, so the problem comes here that, so as you can see here, when we looked at here at the gradients along this manifold, we also got contributions which were kind of mixed terms from ZZ and X. And these were eliminated then in, in the, by doing the Newton's method. Now, when you, if you have some, I don't know, power law, like if you have a lot of terms which with larger support, it gets more messy here. And the question is how well will you be? I mean, in principle, you should still be able to, uh, to I mean, you'll have more terms, more, more more equations for which you've learned, you look for the zeros, but 
in principle it should work but maybe in practice then uh, it's harder to just solve this last step because you'll have contributions from your less local terms and, and the mixed, the products of, of here. But it also depends a bit, like if you are close to, to an, uh, with high temperatures, close to infinite temperature, then we see that these mixed terms are very weak. So maybe if you're kind of in a hotter regime, it's easier, but so in principle possible, but it gets, it's more difficult to cut where you stop. Thanks. Mike, Michael Dubitz, please. Hi, very interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about something on your conclusion slide, which is your statement that this is a an ansatz free way of um, characterizing the local complexity. So I guess I would push back a little bit and say there's a huge ansatz here, which is you have this machine learning network, which restricts the type of information that can be encoded. I'm wondering if, if you could comment on what, what is known about what information can and cannot be encoded in this type of, of um, I guess it's a neural network. Yeah. So I guess my, my, why I wrote this is that, I mean, usually, so compared to some quantum info, like known measures of uh, kind of complexity that here we don't, in some sense, we do, do not input any, yeah, uh, any physical knowledge from, from before. Uh, because like an alternative would be, and an, I mean, um, so the looking for the, to the entanglement, operator entanglement entropy, but there you already, kind of know, I mean, you put, uh, you have an equation that you're looking for. Well, here you're just feeding in kind of data and well, essentially you're, so you are, because this is some nonlinear transformation, you're, you're tr all you're doing is you're looking for a dimensional reduction of your data. So you're just, let's say up to some error bar that you might set, and that will be the error bar in how well are you reproducing your, your initial data. So up to an error bar, you're looking for the minimal um, number of, of uh, parameters characterizing this, this data. And, and, and this dimensional reduction can go through some nonlinear transformation. I guess this is what is kind of happening in this right. neural network. So I agree with that. And I mean, I guess there are these analogies people draw to RG where kind of each step in the neural network is, is like a, a flow. Um, but in RG, it's somehow a controlled flow. And here it's controlled by this nonlinear uh, transfer function. And it's, it's I, I really am trying to, to ask and try to understand better, what are the limits on the data that you really could capture with this type of encoder? Or is it really, I should just think of this as completely general purpose and, and there are no limits. Any, any O's I put in, it's gonna capture equally well the information. I mean, it's, um, so it's kind of democracy. So I guess, I mean, all expectation values you put in mm, will, I mean, it, like that, what it will, so how you weigh, I mean, so your your test so so your error that tells you how well you are doing the job is it, you can somehow choose it and here I mean so we choose simply I compare the uh, the, the the kind of these reproduced expectation values with respect to the initial ones I could do some more weighting to like I could somehow weight them differently to boost some some particular physics. So here is something, I mean, in some sense, you're just, mm, yeah, blindly trying to reproduce all operators with the, yeah, none of them preferred. Of course, if some are, have smaller expectation values, you might be mm, disregarding them or they will contribute less to your kind of error, which is characterizing you how, 
how, I mean, yeah, they will, depending how big it's some expectation values, maybe they will not count so much. So you might disregard them, but in some sense, this is maybe also physics that's not so crucial. So, I mean, these are the knobs you have, like this, this loss function is kind of the central object. It's something that you're optimizing. So here you might kind of impose some additional features, but yeah, otherwise, and, and maybe some additional physics or so. So this is your kind of <laughs> degree of imagination that you can have, but otherwise, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if I've kind of answered too well, but it's, it's simply some some error that you're or something that you're minimizing, and in this case, is this is the way how much you can reproduce these things with a limited number of degrees of freedom, and this is kind of counting how many degrees of freedom are really important. And now, by weighting differently, you might put a larger weight to something, and then it might change. But that's kind of your choice of what you would like to push. To be okay. Learned. Yeah, uh, thank you. A tragic thing, uh, this were two couple of very nice exchanges, but I have to cut here, Taun, Shashwan, Valioeza. Yeah, you um, can drop me an email or we set a discussion. And, and have right. a private home discussion with Zala about machine learning. I have to thank her again for having devoted the time to a single topic. I think that's a very nice thing with 30 minutes, Sebastian.